Good morning to you all. Welcome to Sunrise Hill. This lovely Monday morning, I am Chamberlain. So. Well, evidently, I'm blessed among men this morning. <laughs> Good morning and welcome. I am Bukola Koka. It's October 9. It's a Monday morning. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayo Makinde. Good to count your blessings one by one. <laughs> <laughs> As they say, Buki. Well, yes, indeed. Um, today, we just want to start out by just reminding the government of what a lot of Nigerians are looking forward to at the end of this year. It's about this special subsidy matter. And of course, it might not go away for a long, long time because if you have seen, followed through, everybody have, at least by now, the trajectory, how those petrol prices just keep going over the roof. And so once upon a time when it was 89, 87, 95, 195, and now look at where we are. Well, yes, the petrol subsidy has since gone. And then um, we're grappling with all of that. And different states, uh, you can obtain it at different prices here in Abuja. Sometimes you see 613 naira per liter from the NMPC depot, uh, petrol stations. And then you see some other areas, 620 naira per liter, some at 619, 670. So it varies. But quick reminder, uh, the Nigeria Labor Congress, TUC, and federal government haven't suspended their strike for uh, 30 days. Remember, 30 days after that meeting that they had, the government just trying to stave off any further injury or hardship to be borne by Nigerians agreed that, okay, for 30 days, we'll sheath our swords. And then they went on to say, look, they will eventually go ahead and have this joint inspection of the refineries because it's not the first time they're saying that. We expect that to come on stream at the end of this year. So the Minister of State for Petroleum, uh, Heineken Lukobiri, that's in the oil sector, uh, Petroleum Resources, the oil sector, did say that um, the refineries, yes, they'll be back on stream in December. And then they also said that uh, their objective is to ensure that in the next few years, Nigeria stops fuel importation from what we have seen there, having gone to the Potaka refinery. They say it will come on board by the end of the year. Worry will come on stream by the end of the first quarter of next year. Kaduna will be on board towards the end of next year. So he says if you now look at that and add that of Dangote refinery, they'll be able to stop fuel importation and Nigerians will be able to enjoy full benefits of the regulation. So that is what they've said again. And it's there, out there for everyone to see. So that on the one hand. On the other hand, we know that they also have released the approved five billion and then two billion have been released to states. And we always will keep asking that question of state governments. Where's transparency? That's what we want to see now. So upon what templates are they going on with this subsidy, the palliatives? Beyond the buses, we hear you. Uh, some states, a few of them have purchased certain CNG buses. Some have given timelines as to when they will come up with them. But remember, we also did say, we've seen this scripts before in terms of when government came up with buses and several years down the line, in fact, just a quick check today, in many of those states, those buses are no longer in existence and the ones that are there, maybe one or two, are in very bad shape. So what structure do these states have to ensure that these, whatever they're providing for the people, will stand the test of time? But I know that some states say they go ahead and provide grains, and others have committees that include labor, civil society, and the likes. But above all else, if they are developing a framework, it's going to be incredibly important for us to be able to plan in the future because it's the same neck made up of, largely made up of governors, who also said the previous list that they had was not reliable. They didn't trust the data. So now, they are in the driving seat. We want to see the data that they've come up with, such that not when they leave, another government takes over and says, well, we don't trust this data. You can't keep doing the same things and expect different results or keep pulling a wool over our eyes. Two billion, five billion, of course, depending on how you see it, that is significant. And we need to see, they need to tell us. We need to be able to see that, as a matter of fact. You need to be able to access those data very easily for planning purposes and development. 
So that it's not just the political cronies that will get this money. And at the end of the day, people are still feeling the impact because, after all, subsidy is just, I mean, palliatives is just for a moment in time. Mm -hmm. So in the long run, what economic plans? I'm still waiting on the government to see how those plans will help you and I because, goodness me, we are all in this. We're all affected with this. It's not just for a few. It will be for everybody. Indeed, uh, Chamberlain, information is now beginning to emerge as to, you know, the social register from the conversation that our uh, sister program had with the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs yesterday. We now know that uh, the distribution or the disbursement, rather, of 25,000 naira per month to Nigerians, to vulnerable households, will begin on October the 17th. And without quoting the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs copiously, I recall she also said that um, the social register that they have now uh, is to the tune of about 15 million Nigerians. And they'll be focusing on the heads of those households uh, rather than uh, the, you know, other dependents of the households. So we know uh, that they're cleaning up the register. And uh, I, I believe she also spoke to the extent that they're developing a template, a framework for the social register such that they are hinging it on um, BVN and uh, NIN, uh, uh, the identification number, the social identification number. So it appears as if we're beginning to have a template for the social register. Now, how much of Nigerians on that register are actually vulnerable? Because we also have that challenge of uh, lack of inclusion in terms of our banking system, of those who are really poor. So how much of poor Nigerians are on, vulnerable Nigerians are on that social register is what we do not know. And I believe that we need to ask further questions to that effect of the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and indeed the subnationals as a matter of fact, which brings me to the point of the distribution of palliatives that is agitating the minds of Nigerians. You know, it should also agitate the press, particularly because of what is coming out from the distribution of palliatives. What some local governments, uh, residents of some local governments are parading on social media is to the effect that what they're getting are mere rations. So, and this is, you know, significant because before the social register, you know, was cleaned up or before we got news that, you know, government is beginning to have something that is of a template, the distribution of palliatives had begun already in most states of the Federation. And, you know, Nigerians were worried as to what exactly is government using to distribute these palliatives? Is it actually getting to the vulnerable, the real people that need it? And we saw videos that went viral on social media about you know, party members fighting over palliatives. And there is also that component, you know, I, I'll never tire of talking about it, of distribution of grains to farmers in, you know, uh, the two billion naira that was initially released to subnationals. How's that going? There's no news about that, you know, and there's also the need for security on the farms such that farmers can return to their farms. I, I wonder if there's any activity in that regard, you know, to that effect. So there's actually very, very little reassurance, you know, about the structure of the distribution of palliatives. And before government now releases the three billion naira balance to subnationals, I believe that there is a need for the humanitarian affairs ministry to work with the subnationals such that we can have some form of accountability. Now, as far as, you know, what triggers, triggered this in the first place is concerned, that's the removal of fuel subsidy. It is now evident that there was no structure on ground, uh, and, and that's gaping, and that's why we're where we are. And by the way, there is that continuing increase in the price of uh, fuel, you know, across states. Initially, what we had was 575 naira, and then there was, you know, a surreptitious addition of 5 naira in, um, you know, uh, other major marketers, uh, filling stations owned by major marketers. And there's another addition of 5 naira. So what we have now, those selling at 575, you know, and initially are now selling at 585 naira per liter. So this reality is going to be with us for a very, very long time. You know, but then again, uh, perhaps we should be grateful because of the realities of Forex and what really, you know, sh pri uh, the pump price of petrol should be selling for, you know, at this time. So we must remind Labour about 
monitoring, you know, the refineries and the delivery date. Are we going to get, you know, um, the refineries working by December, the first quarter of next year, and the middle quarter of next year, as government has promised? But one of the guests that we had on the program last week, one of the labor leaders at the national level, wasn't quite optimistic. And, you know, that worries me. Maybe I should leave it there for now. Ayo. You know, um, let, let's begin with numbers. I recall uh, Dr. Tokwe Fashua, an economist, and I think he's now an appointee of the federal government, you know, talking about the 69 million people in the register, which should be correlated with other databases. He wrote, and I quote, we have 90 million Nigerians registered for NIN, 96 million Nigerians in Annex register, um, 56 million Nigerians with BVN, and we have an outstanding um, population census to embark on. I one wonders, you know, where all of that is going. It's quite a lot of um, work that whoever is in government now has mm. to contend with. There is no doubt about it. But as the president has said, he asked for the job, so he's got the job to do. Now, having said that, you know, quickly speak to one thing that you both have, have talked about, and that's the fact that in the end, and at the end of all of these, the most important thing is monitoring. Budget has over and over again called on Nigerians to follow, uh, you know, up with the budgeting in their states. Follow the money also asks you to follow the money, you know. So where are all these things going? Labor is making a promise or perhaps even a commitment to the fact that they are going to ensure that they monitor the cutting down of the cost of governance. How is that going to happen? I guess it's one thing that we have to wait and see. So labor can mobilize uh, the, their unions and their you know, states, um, uh, administrations all over the country. To, they can mo mobilize them to call out for a strike. Fine. Can you also mobilize them to monitor cost of governance in their states? So it's not the only, the only time we hear that labor is active is not when we are calling out for a strike, but call attention to some other things as well. So if the cost of governance can be cut down, please, how will that be significant? Yes, the president made an effort the last time when you know, people wanted to go with the president to the UNGA 78, and that's fine. But how about the civil servants in the organizations, in the various more than 1,500 ministries, departments, and agencies of the federal government? And how many MDAs in the states also can we monitor their spending so that all of these things can factor in into this conversation of cutting down the cost of governance? Now, to the fuel subsidy thing, there's a, you know, a, a report that we, we know that not one administration has you know, tried to find out exactly what this whole probing is about. But for God's sake, where is all this going? Talking about the social register again, a very painstaking effort was made to put up the, 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 uh, the uh, social register in the first place. Very, very painstaking, supported by the World Bank. And a good number of uh, people from the office of the vice president at the time went about this. For whatever reason, the state governments are saying it's not it's clean enough for them, fine. But before you clean it up, you collected two billion naira each from the federal government, and now here we are. Ladies and gentlemen, someone should follow the money. Chimberly. Yeah, and uh, that's what we all ought to do, and ensure that these public funds are utilized properly, because some of these governors were there at the time that register was being developed. And then today they say, no, we don't trust that document. And some of their predecessors were in the same party. They accepted it. So we just need to be you know, reasonable with some of these things. Well, let's go on and take a look at some of the dailies and see what they reflect. We'll start off with, um, there's no telegraph here. So let's kick off with that one. It talks about 2023 polls aftermath. Political cases causing congestion in courts ascribed to lawyers. Blame preference for such matters. Want adjudication of political cases redefined. Yeah, well, we're going this route again. And it appears as though we'll just go around in circles. But look, there are several things that um, we want to see change um, in terms of doing things differently. This current government 
have got to also do a lot more things differently than we've seen before. In a bid to engender transparency across different institutions, remember why we don't want to just have strong men, we need strong institutions, not the ones that you know the civil servants will come and tell you when they want to resume, when they want to close, how you can do without them saying, well, and then you see why things don't just move forward. And the system seems to accommodate that, which is ridiculous. And so we need to change the way the uh, president, the, the way INEC chairman is appointed. We need to change the way judges are appointed. You know, the president cannot keep being the one to sign off or appoint and then come. There has to be a better way to do these things such that, because if we've been doing the same thing the same way, and we're still where we are today with lots of complaints, these are lawyers themselves complaining about administration of justice taking a hit. Last week, it was lawyers who also raised concerns about how judges are complaining of exhaustion, and they are overburdened with several cases. And you know, just go out there and ask people in terms of their perception about judiciary, you will get a proper feel of why some of these things need to change. So those are some of the immediate challenges, the immediate things that need to change. And the remuneration, the structure of local government. So a lot really needs to change. So they need to let us know that they are here to ensure that you reset the system in the manner of speaking. So just one more here. Uh, Omobalale Rahim's murder. ASP Vandi knows fate today as court delivers judgment. So, um, hoping as well that um, this justice is not just done, but it should be seen to have been done. That's New Telegraph this morning. And up next this morning is a leadership newspaper which focuses on security uh, for its lead story. Listen to this. 1,591 students, 61 core members abducted in eight years. And there's just one riders, uh, one rider rather. Experts call for surveillance cameras in schools. Terrorists kill 10, abduct many in fresh Zamfara attacks. So what exactly is happening in Zamfara State. You know, we still have the um, students from the university in Kasina that were abducted. They are yet to be rescued. And uh, the outstanding core members in Zamfara State that are also yet to be rescued. Uh, from what we gather, um, you know, the federal government and the state government seems to be in some form of disagreement about whether um, they're negotiating with bandits in Zampara State. Nigeria's Northwest certainly needs some form of, um, you know, attention as far as security is concerned. Um, it's totally unacceptable that, uh, you know, the country is helpless where the Northwest is concerned. Uh, that's it for the big story. Uh, there's also this one above the big story on the front page as well. 87.4 trillion Naira national debt. Stakeholders frown at excessive borrowing. Well, there's been some reassurance from the administration that uh, uh, they'll try and reduce borrowing as much as possible. But 87.4 trillion is certainly something to be worried about. Um, above, under the nameplate, Tinubu snubs Niger coup leaders overtures for direct talks. So, since there's some progress uh, in that regard. It's a page seven read by the way, just in case you're interested. And by the way, what's happening at the borders with Niger, the West African borders, um, Benin Republic, and the borders, you know, with Niger from our own side at the north. You know, the last visuals that we got from that, uh, those parts of the country and uh, the continent were traders, you know, who were murdered because of the sanctions imposed on Niger. And uh, I wonder if there's been an update in that regard and what West African leaders are doing to salvage the situation. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's only for those, those who live in those communities that will be able to give us the real picture of what exactly is happening to them in that regard. Mm -hmm. But, you know, those conversations need to also happen conversations with the communities because without them, without those conversations, I wonder how far we really can go. Yeah, and just in case you leave, um, you know, at those borders, you can just tweet at us and let us know.
what exactly is happening so that the conversation can keep going. Uh, there's this one, which is cherry, by the way, and the last before we exit leadership. FISC reduces road traffic crash deaths by 23.1%. Let's leave it there for leadership newspaper. The Guardian newspaper is uh, calling attention to something we may not be giving attention to, and it's about what happened on Saturday. War in Middle East may spiral, push monthly petrol subsidy to 644.8 billion naira. I, so subsidy is gone, subsidy is back. I don't, I don't understand, but hey. Um, speaks to also what you mentioned what, the other time with. about uh, you know, the cost of um, the, the forex rates and then the rising cost of crude in the global market. The details you'll find on page six of the paper. Among other stories you find on the front page, I'm excited about this particular one. Tinubu pledges 500,000 jobs as our Jaokuta still nears completion. This project started in the 80s, was supposed to last between two to four years or thereabouts, and here we are. Nearly 44 years exactly. after. So um, let's just complete this thing. What, what is gonna happen from what I know is that a huge load of imports will stop. All the steel that we are importing from here and there mm -hmm. will definitely cease. And a good number of manufacturing will begin to happen in the country, and that's just for Ajakuta steel alone. How much, how, how much more the um, uh, indirect labor that it will also create. That's the Guardian newspaper this morning. We'll take a look at Daily Independent next. Technology. Insider abuse, fraud enablers in banks. Very sad commentary because they're supposed to be the other way around. Because the, look, there are several cases which we know of, uh, several, or lots of them. The kind of corruption, the kind of things that go on there, you just wonder. Well, now that there's a new CBN governor, new sheriff in town, in the manner of speaking, these are the things that we expect them to address headlong. How is it that people, fraudsters, can open an account using your name and maybe change a letter to the same bank that you've got an account? And certain persons, you write the bank and inform them, listen, this is going on, this is not right. They reply you, they will do something, and months on end, the fraud still goes on. That's part of why they're talking about insider abuse. And so, this is a lot, and it really has got to be addressed. So um, perhaps that's why Daily Independent is calling and bringing attention to this. And these fraudsters seem to have studied the system to take advantage of it because they know when you go to either, even if it's special fraud unit or the police station, depending on which one, if it's still happening in those stations, they'll tell you, well, um, you have to provide us with this and that to be able to carry out certain functions. They are simply asking you to bribe them to carry out investigation because there are several cases that are before both the special fraud unit and it hasn't moved an inch in those cases. So it is huge. These are the things that you, you just wonder. Can a country keep running like this? So it, it, it's really shocking. And uh, look, anyway, there are several things. We'll, at some point, there will be a special feature on some of these things so that we can you know, be in the spotlight on some of these banks and what goes on, and they appear to look the other way. Even the agencies who are supposed to investigate it seem to be encouraging. That's the independent this morning, guys. This morning is the Nigerian Tribune, which tows a completely different part from the others, uh, focusing on the upcoming of cycle elections. But you know, raising some concern. Again, INEC raises concern over insecurity in Imo, Kogi, Bayelsa. It's a page 22 read. And uh, of course, we'll be asking a lot more questions in that regard for you later on on the program today. As uh, people head to the polls, they need reassurance about being able to vote uh, without um, any fear whatsoever. Uh, listen to this one under the big story. Wiki orders demolition of multi-billion naira property despite court order. That's a page 27 read. And over the weekend, we also heard 
the Minister of the Federal Capital Territory in an engagement with the, the Justice of the Federal Capital Territory, uh, appealing that you know court injunctions that prevent um, the, the FCT Ministry from doing its job to be reduced as much as possible. Of course, there's more clarity required in that regard uh, as far as uh, demolition is concerned. So we're not just seeing demolitions in Lagos, demolitions are in the FCT as well. Uh, right under that one, near 1,000 killed in Israel-Palestine war. That's a page five. Page five read, yes indeed. Over the weekend, it was the, the death toll was just uh, 22, and it has shot up to 1,000. Uh, you know, depicting the extent and magnitude of the situation in um, Israel and Palestine, in the Gaza Strip, to be precise. Uh, there's also there are two other stories. Kogi 2023, don't allow strangers. APC urges electorate. Of course, we saw the vice president uh, leading the campaign ahead of the governorship election in that state. And lastly, from the front page of the Nigerian Tribune, customs intercept 12 trailers of imported rice across southwest Nigeria. And despite these and all other policies that are seemingly favorable, rice is still 50,000 naira per bag, well, depending on where you're buying it from. Let's leave it there for the Nigerian Tribune. Hmm. The Abuja Inquirer is next this morning, and uh, the lead story is FCTA residents tussle over Berger Park <coughs> construction. Uh, there is a uh, back and forth there, the riders. It distorts Abuja master plan, according to residents. Not true. FCTA fires back. So who should know the Abuja master plan better? I don't know. But the details you'll find on the, on the front page continues on page three of the paper, right above the nameplate, NDLEA arrests man 67 who ingested 100 wraps of cocaine in Abuja. Wanna die? <laughs> anyway, the details are on the front page, continues also on page three of the paper. And um, this one, right beside the picture at the bottom of the page, Buhari's ex-minister said he failed woefully, living in regret. Which minister? Find the details on page three of the Abuja Inquirer this morning. And with that, we have come to the end of a look at some of the front pages of the dailies this morning, but not the program. The issues right after this program, this break, are up. Just stay with us. Some national commissioners of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, representatives of political parties and the civil society organizations gather at the main conference hall of the Electoral Institute in Abuja for the annual memorial lecture of Professor Abubakar Momo, who was the director general of the institute between 2013 and 2017. While the occasion affords INEC the opportunity to remember the contributions of late Professor Abubakar Momo to electoral reforms in the country, the focus of the discussions here is about the lessons that INEC can draw from the 2023 general elections to better its performances in upcoming state elections. The successful conduct of the 2023 general elections provides a pedestal upon which we prepare for the forthcoming off-cycle governorship elections. As we are all aware in Imo, Kogi and Bayelsa. Uh, therefore, it's very, very critical and important and imperative to draw insight from what happened in 2023, taking a critical look of what went wrong, what, we, what needs to be improved, as well as to avoid the mistakes and pitfalls 
uh, of 2023 general elections. It is natural that this lecture will generate extensive discourse amongst participants with a view to assess what went well, what were the challenges, and the lessons learned for post-process of seamless conduct of the pending of cycle elections in the three states. The guest lecturer highlights some of the recurring challenges with the country's electoral system. In India, for example, the, the election period is spread over about five, five phases. It is not done all on the same day. And it's because of the logistic product that we, that we create. But we do all our own on the same day for President and National Assembly. And, and you can imagine the number of... So the, 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 there is room, there is definitely some room for margin of errors. He also proffers some solutions. Look, you may change the electoral law 100 times, but the police are not going to change their mind. So that's why this whole question of, you know, getting involved in drafting the law, we are meeting with this, we are doing, uh, you know, uh, this, this clause, we put it there, the acceptable. No, but I mean, that, the, the reality is that don't let us waste time on changing the law. What we need to change is to change attitudes. The upcoming off-season governorship elections in Imo, Bayelsa and Koki State will be the first major elections to be conducted by INEC after the conclusion of the 2023 general elections. Many at this gathering are hoping to see how the electoral umpire would improve on its performances, drawing from the lessons of the 2023 general elections. Welcome back. Yes, indeed. Uh, now we're talking about the forthcoming uh, Yasa, Imo, and Kogi governorship elections. And uh, we've got uh, Chief Peter Ame here with us. He is the former chairman Interparty Party Advisory Council. Good morning and thank you for coming on today. Good morning, Chairman. Thanks. So, Anneg released uh, the publisher's statement, a press release, raising some concerns about this forthcoming IASA, IMO, and governorship elections about preparations on this matter. So two, some of the two key areas which they did highlight is the, uh, one of which is the upload of the list of party agents by all political parties. The commission says that um, it notified political parties in terms of what is expected of them, which that actually started on the 24th of August. So, uh, however, despite... This notice and subsequent reminders, political parties are yet to substantially comply by submitting the list of their agents for Bayelsa, Imo, and Kogi State. Only 55% of the expected total of 1,000, I beg your pardon, of 189,180 polling units have been uploaded to the designated INEC portal. Specifically, they went ahead and broke it down. So... 29,248 out of the expected 40,372, that's about 72% for Bayelsa State. And then you get to see 51,681 out of the 85,644, that's 60.3% for Emo State. And then you get to see... 23,720 out of the 63,144, that's 37.6% uh, for Kogi State, have uploaded this list of party, uh, yeah, of party agents. So this is contrary to what the commission expects of them. And then it goes on to say, similarly, only 25.1% of the expected 15,804 coalition agents in three states have been uploaded. That's uh, 1,246, that's about 26%, out of 4,806 for Bayelsa. And then 1,638, that's 27.3%, out of the 5,994 for Imo. And then 1,095, that's 21.9%, uh, out of the 5,000 four for Kogi State. So the commission says these numbers are grossly discouraging. But they were quick to say that um, 
They're further reminding political parties that the portal will automatically shut down at midnight Thursday, 10th October. There shall be no extension. Consequently, all parties sponsoring candidates for the elections that are yet to upload the list of their agents should do so before the deadline for the exercise. They went ahead and raised security concerns, you know, for these states that um, I think is almost becoming a common feature now, security concerns by the commission. But first of all, let's talk about this now. This, you know, this result, this... Uh, response here from the commission, they themselves say they are hugely disappointed in spite of the several meetings that they've had with the commission. What do you think could have informed this? Um, thank you very much. Good morning, Nigerians. I, I think I like um, think called the time that he has expectations of um, political party to, you know, you know, work in line with the regulation and uh, they call it regulation and conduct of elections that has been stipulated in the guidelines of INEC for 2022. Uh, INEC, the, that, that is captured in uh, um, part one, page seven, and um, uh, number nine, 11, and 10. Uh, for I like think that these expectations I have of political party must be met at all costs, and because it's necessary for us to have a credible and, and transparent election that will represent the true wishes of the people. Yeah. But INEC has also forgotten that the political party has expectations of INEC. Expectations of INEC in the sense that if elections are manipulated, if elections are rigged, if elections are not conducted transparently, it weakens the fabric of the political party's interest to be able to speak to citizens, to have interest to participate or come forward to bring their passport or their names to be filled at pulling unit agent. Because the people, when they are broken, when they are disappointed in the system, you find out that their interest is no longer there. Look at 2023 election. People were, people were offering themselves to be pulling agent, to be coalition officers for political party. People were running around looking at their own money, using their own money to snap passport. But today, the political party are struggling, are struggling under, under, under the dark shadow of, of citizens' lack of interest in the political system. Citizens' lack of confidence in the electoral process. So it, it is not only INEC that should be having expectations of political party. Political party also have expectations of INEC. And if the both sides are not working in line with the regulations as, as INEC has already in, uh, enshrined in its own guidelines, if they are not working in that, in that line, then there's effect that you have negative tendencies on the conduct of election and the interest of Nigerians to participate freely and with you know, buoyant interest. You know, but why would I thought that um, political parties, these polling agents that the commission is asking for, they are party members, not regular Nigerians. Of course. So how is this apathy a result of, of this, of what you've spoken about? They, they are party members who belong to a political party, who participate in the election, mm -hmm. who felt these processes were not transparent enough to favor the interests of their parties. I would felt that elections are no longer, you know, true representations of those who go to the ballot to cast one man, one vote. So these are the challenges. You know, the more, the more like, I tell, like I said several times, the voter party you experience on election day is the same thing you express when it comes to um, citizen participation in the electoral process. It's the same thing. Because if, it, if citizens don't have interest, if they, if, they, if they don't believe that what they are going to do, we, we, we enriched or contribute to the growth or, or transparent process of the conduct of election, they feel there's no need. So political parties, the because I mean, time and again, we hear parties tell us, look, they are always optimistic that they will win the elections. So is it that that optimism now, is, it doesn't trickle down to the members as agents, it only rests with the principal, the candidates who are vying for those offices? Uh, the, the, can, the candidate could be optimistic. You don't contest the election, you don't put your resources in an election, especially in a client where, you know, the person contesting will almost bring half of the money, you know, where people don't support. Except the only time we've seen the difference, I've been in the system for a very long time, the only time we've seen difference where citizens were, you know, very interested in putting their money in an election was in 2023. Before, you have to, you have to run around to talk to them and make them interested. So well, candidates must have interest and hoping that things will, you know, turn out right. But, but the, the, the expectations of those who, who participate in the process, especially citizens who determine the outcome of an election, who should determine the outcome of an election is different. You, you can't put them on the same pedestal. But, but one thing I want to say is that I, I think parties are really interested and, and they are struggling with you know, the current realities of our, of our system to try to want to do the right thing. And I, and I know that pulling in unit agents is very critical. But let me tell you, how do you, how do you now say pulling in unit agents is critical? Anak was getting it right. In Ondo, I do election, the last one before the one that we're going to conduct. I like save the electoral process by making sure that elections are transmit, transmitted electronically via the beavers, 
to the IRF. Yeah. And, and, that, and that brought a lot of security to the process because where our elections are, are, are where our elections start to experience the toggling you see, the violence is seen, is because people think that when a when election result is being transported manual physically from a pulling unit to a collection center, those who have power, those who can, you know, who can enlist the the, 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 how they call it, employ those who can create violence, who have capacity to create destructive system, disrupt the system, they will now hijack that electoral ballot papers on the way to the collection center. Mm. And that's where the, the heightened interest of violence comes in. Okay. But if INEC goes ahead to do what is necessary and what has been, you know, you know in, what has been written in their guidelines and regulations, then it will be easier to transmit that result for pulling in it and it will reduce the level of violence in our electoral system and also increase the interest of the people in participating mm. in the process. Now, about this participation and then the morale of which this list is being affected, but, you know, for different states, some of them are governed by PDP, APC, these are the ruling parties. And so you'll expect that at least enthusiasm in some of those states shouldn't be this low, given that they have their parties who are in power. So is it that this optimism and this uh, at least lack of enthusiasm is also affecting those parties who even won the elections? Those parties that, that, I, that are in government have always preferred the system. That is the truth from 1999 indeed. And that's why our multi-party democratic system has not flourished or expanded you know, to the level it, you know, it was, uh, the level of expectation mm -hmm. by our founding fathers in the 1999 constitution. See, one thing you should know, that no political party can boast of having members that can elect, it, elect him into office. No political party. The, the, the electorate is totally different from the members of political party. If, if we put political party membership under scrutiny, you, could, you can't say those who were elect the, the candidate were all members of the political party. It's not true. The truth is that there are citizens whose lives are affected by the decision of those who get into government. They, are, they don't belong to political party, but they belong to a, a, a political system that we're operating just like what we have today, and they go to vote in the line of that interest of those who they feel who get into government and protect the constitution, act in line with the constitution, and also create an enabling environment for, for businesses and how they call it investment to thrive. So that, those are one of the issues that we have in our system. So you can't say that um, the, the citizens have lost, the how they call political parties are not having the same enthusiasm. It's in fact that the citizens, majority of them, have lost hope and have lost interest in the transferring process to which elections should be conducted. So is that to say that what INEC has spoken about now it will be difficult to remedy it or get at least 90%, if not 95 as they want. I, I will, all I would do is to encourage the parties and encourage Nigerians, you know, because the system can't change itself. We must continue to act in the right, in the right direction. We must continue to do the right thing. Pulling agents act, you know, in a very, uh, very, they play a very critical role in making sure that the, 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 the votes of every political party, you know, is um, effectively or, you know, you know, to a level protected, you know, from... From being stolen because at the end of the day, if I'm ec 8 a that will be given at the pulling unit will be given to the pulling unit agent, and that's why I think that they should do all everything possible to try to you know encourage both um, citizens that a few will participate, you know, how um, they call it communities and people they know that can speak to these people to get this form uploaded so that you know we can have a more effective um, electoral process. Are you booking? Kimberlyn, Mr. Amir, good morning from Lagos. I'm wondering, do you think that it's the same problem bedeviling the electorate where we're now having, uh, you know, very serious fears about voter apathy is the same that is now bedeviling um, party agents, you know, with the political parties not yet fulfilling the expectation, you know, of INEC as far as the supply of uh, political party agents is concerned? Yes, I, I believe so. You know, at the time where we're at the end of affairs, you know, running political parties in Nigeria, we, we, we used to have difficulties in, in speaking to, um, um, how they call it, electorate to believe that our parties, you know, that are not in government, you know, that don't have access to public resources, that can't manipulate the process to get it to win, you know, should have them as pulling you that they tell you, you know, or to what end, you know, so they, 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 people lost hope. But immediately I next started giving hope to the electorate. Immediately I next started, you know, you know, creating, bringing, introducing technology into our electoral process that was, you know, a bit, that was looking more like there, there was hope 
People, people, people woke up. There, there was a resurgence. People woke up. People were very interested in the process. And I, I can tell you, if you take statistics and you do a survey in the 2023 election, you'll find out the interest of what people had in 2023, even with the CVR continual voter registration that I've never experienced before, the level of people who came in, you will see that it was all geared towards the fact that the elections will be conducted on the promises made by INEC, that the election will be conducted on the regulations and guidelines 2022 as, as, as brought out and signed by the commission. So, and, and when that failed, uh, citizen interest we, 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 we nose dive. And when that citizen interest nose dive, it, it affects all areas of election. You know, election is a pre, during, and post, you know, activity. It's not just, it, election is not just a one-day affair. It, 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 there's, a, there's a pre, and there's a, there's a during, and there's a post. So it, it does build up. You now start to see those challenges that people no longer believe that whatever they do or whatever we, decisions they take will have a positive effect or change the outcome of the election, that those who vote no longer determine who, who, who elect those people, about it's those who count the vote. So these are the challenges that the system is having. I, I believe also, like I said, political party also have expectations of INEC, and that expectations, you know, that INEC has a political party. If both of them come on two sides, in meeting that expectation, I believe it will be better for our democratic process. Now, uh, you, you've re-emphasized time and again the um, expectations that political parties have of INEC, but we can't take off of our minds that concern that INEC is overburdened, you know, with conducting elections, with ensuring uh, you know, the process is seamless, and of course also working with uh, security agents to also ensure the peace of the elections. Talk less of the prosecution of electoral offenders. Um, should INEC uh, also, um, sh how, sh how should we take this burden off of INEC such that, you know, the major expectations can be met without uh, the, the, the quantum, the volume of responsibility placed on it? I think those who watched my, you know, activities over the years, I've, I've always stood on the side that INEC should be unbundled. INEC is overburdened. INEC is um, carrying too much load on his head. INEC is responsible for registration of political parties, for monitoring of political parties' internal activities, you know, for engaging with political parties. INEC is also responsible for delineation to create constituency, to do all these sort of things. INEC is responsible to take legal actions against those who have, you know, conducted themselves, you know, against the rule of law in, during the conduct of our elections. INEC is also responsible for, for you know, trying to uh, conduct election itself. So there are two, if you look at Justice Will panel, and you know, a lot of things, a lot of recommendation was done there. I, I, I think when people are outside government and when they're inside government, their decisions are different. Because first of okay, all, when we're, when we're, he was still in civil society and I was Secretary General of Interparty Advisory Council, we met in Portacourt. And it, we did what we call, you know, uh, you know uh, electoral amendment. And he was the one who was moderating this. And we agreed that Annex should be unbundled. We also agreed that there should be a political party regulation and management commission. We agree that there should be an electoral violence commission that deals with electoral violence. And because if you don't have that, INEC had not been, what are the statistics of prosecution that INEC has carried out successfully over the years of the conduct of election? You can, you can see it up to zero. And, and you find out that those who are in government, because the attorney generals of the state have um, normally prosecute powers, to be able to withdraw cases of electoral violence, especially when it deals with their own parties, you, you find out nothing of such has been successful. So we, we, we believe that unbundling of INEC to have election commission, election commission that is solely res re um, responsible for just conduct of elections. And then you have political party regulation and management commission that will be responsible for registering political party, managing political party, and looking at how political party functions in line with regulations that are supposed to make them function effectively. Then you also have election offenses commission, which will be dealing specifically with those who have taken into their powers into their hands to manipulate our electoral system, to steal the vote of the people, to create toggle in the process, and then create violence that will affect the lives of those who are, you know, to, to carry out functions of election. So it, it is important that we do an all, on a call and comparison review of the commission, and then break the commission, and then give the commission the name that it suits it. Independent National Electoral Commission. Let it just stay for the conduct of election. Let it not overburden itself with a lot of other things. So in that case, the commission is actually different from the INEC chairman because the commission, you know, it consists, consists of national electoral commissioners that they sit, I think it's on Wednesday also, or Thursday, and then take decisions of how the commission should function. And that will help go a long way to help the, the conduct of our election to have more 
you know, I take off more burden for my neck. And then I will have a focus, a thin line focus of what to do when it comes to conduct of election. And it's also important that it will pay, it, we need to remove the appointment of INEC from the hand, because any president that is contesting the election today is, is, is contesting with other candidates of political party and is playing at a higher, higher level from other candidates of political parties. Because you, you, he is the one that appoints, the appointing authority always have a say. You are, it, 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 look, we, we can't take democracy from America or from anywhere, and they act in line with those people act. The institutions were already strong. The institutions were already are taking so many years to establish. So we must redefine democratic processes, democratic functions, in line with the attitude of our politicians, and then make sure that it works in a way that the interest of our people is at the top notch level of whatever decision that we're taking. That's why we need to make sure whoever will be responsible to, to, to appoint the INEC chairman must be the people, in the sense that we can let the National Judicial Council, you know, put out a notice to the Nigerian public. Because if you look at the Attorney General of States in America, most of them are elected. They're elected so that they can function in line with the people. We can also, divide, you know, have a local breed process of how our electoral commission is arranged. They put out a notice to the Nigerian public. A, a, the people put in the application. They shortlist about five people. Take it to the National Assembly. The National Assembly consists of a lot of people. So you are not going to be beholden to 360 to 109 senators. You are not going to be beholden to all of them at once. You know, that would be so obvious because, and there will be a clause that for an elected chairman to, re, to be removed, you, when you follow that process, the, that tree will be forwarded but by the NJC to the National Judiciary, to the National Assembly. The National Assembly will review it well, you, and then it will be cast on the floor of the House. And then some, one of them will be elected. And when they are elected, they resume as the chairman of the commission. This yeah, goes for members Amen, of the, that, the that, commission. That's as, and then as that lucid. is done successfully. Yes, that's as lucid as it can be, and uh, we hope that the National Assembly can take a cue from it and prioritize, you know, that um, amendment of um, the Commission in this 10th Assembly. But uh, amid all of these concerns, has the purpose of this conversation perhaps been defeated, you know, with the charged political atmosphere in Kogi and, and uh, Imo states, to be precise? Uh, how optimistic are you that there'll be any significant difference from the narrative that will come out of that process, apart from concerns of security and uh, ballot box snatching? I, I, I think, you know, the governors are the most, you know, difficult, I call them emperors. They are, nobody shares power with them in the state. They, they have total control of power in the state. They, the state assemblies are in the vegetative state. They are spineless bootleggers. They don't take any decision against the governor. And you, you find out that even the, the traditional rulers can be removed by the local government chairman. And then the judicial system can be, sta can be starved of funds. So the governors are totally, I could call it, strangulating the, the, the state's so, uh, they call it democratic processes. And they are so determined to always return wherever they want. So it is, if, I think, basically for me, it is because of the state governors and how they manipulate power and how they use power to, you know, to, full, to, to its full um, potential, like 100%, you know, because power is not used that way. Is, that is why I really feel that the electoral system must be really amended to help, to help put and call these people to order. And because without that, there's nothing really anybody can do. Even because if, uh, Mr. To, Amen, you know, just uh, a second, on that, that issue, take it uh, and run with my it. apologies for butting in, on that issue that you just raised, even if um, the laws were amended and everything else is done, it comes back to the people, the political actors. Part of the comments that the INEC statement uh, says is that the commission, that's INEC, has constantly called on parties to rein in their supporters from actions capable of jeopardizing the peaceful conduct of elections in Nigeria. You've uh, administered a pack of political parties before, so how easy or difficult is that? Why is that such a challenge? You, 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 can't, you, can't, you, you are trying to look at the, you know, the, the outcome of a... Of a, of an, and uh, they call it a very rooted, you know, um, I don't want to use disease. It, it, that's what you're looking at. You know, the, the, it's not a challenge for political parties. As soon as, you know, there were issue based, you know, we can't go to issue based, we can't run away from most, um, um, because of more slinging, name calling, and because the people are not tailoring this thing to telling the people what to do. And that's why you find out people get to power and they don't know what to do because they don't, they don't have to say anything. All they need to insult themselves, insult their opponent, and then, you know, find a way to get to power. 
So if, if these things, if you don't have a credible electoral process, sincerely speaking, well, there's uh, no way you can rein in Mr. Man, at the end of the day, power. on that power, same there issue, will not be power articulation, on there that will same be... issue, at the end of the day, no matter what the process is, it is people that are going to run it. It's people that we have in INEC, and we are calling INEC to order. It is people that we have in the National Assembly who will amend the laws. But it is also people that will execute that law that you are asking to be amended. So, and the major actors in the electoral process are political parties, also made of, guess what, people. So if the political parties do not have that culture of peace, of going into elections with peace in mind and with the genuine interest of the people, no matter what laws we come up with, how is it going to make any difference? So it goes back to how the political parties themselves are able to rein in their supporters because we don't have these quarrels at the top. It's always at the bottom of the rung. So how do we ensure that political parties get the memo to administer themselves, to coordinate themselves in a way that fosters peace and encourages people to come out to, to, vote, to vote. See, our, our, our party system is broken. If you look at First and Second Republic, well, when you come to meetings, the, the party chairmen are the leaders of their parties because the money comes from people, market women, people contribute money to the management of a political party. And as the party chairman has an independent fund from where it works to determine what you know, party should do. But if you go to state right now, the governors are the, gover are the leaders of their party. If you come to the federal, the president is the leader of the party because they bring funding, they bring money, whether it is legal or illegal, I don't know. But they bring a lot of money into the system. They determine what, how the function of the National Working Committee for act. And if a governor wakes up, he doesn't like his state chairman, he can remove him. If a president wakes up, he doesn't like his national chairman, he can remove him. Where you have, you know, you could say you have some level of internal democratic process is when people are not in power. When they're in power, those who are in power, then start to manipulate the electoral system, start to manipulate the party management system. See, we must, first of all, give independence to certain, certain you know, organizations that are involved in the conduct of election. Then we also help the party system to get stabilized and get some level of independence from the caprice and wings of those wings who get into power and think that power itself is what they want. And that's why you don't see policies, you don't see articulations of goals or, or how people want to function. So if you say that parties can rein in their supporters and the governor who is running under the platform of the party and say, no, these are my supporters, you know, and I have the resources to push them, there's a problem. You can't say that law is not enough. Law has helped to, help to progress our electoral process to a certain level, but it was, you know, truncated at the, the, the term of, you know, how they call it, delivery. Hmm. So it goes back to that same issue. Now, I mean, you've recommended that political party. Sincere apologies, Jamie. Let me just put this one in. So you're talking about us, you know, having this conversation with political parties, uh, you know, with the National Assembly to amend the laws. That's fine. But how about having a kind of conversation with political parties, with the major political actors, the political graduators, so that they will be able to understand what you said about the First Republic and the Second Republic, where the, the, the party leaders were not the ones going into the polls. They are the, they, they are, the administration of the political parties are independent from the people that have been employed through the ballot box. How do we get back to what we had then that worked well for us? Look, I, I, maybe you just you know, the, the, from, the, from the first explanation, as soon as we started with Chamberlain here, yeah, I told you, I said in 2023, you will not, you will not deny, you, you will see it, you saw it, that people contributed to political, to political movement. People contributed their resources to, to get people to get to vote. People contributed money to get the CVR successful. People did that, not outside the party funding. But people lose interest when that process is truncated, when it is not transparent. Our, a lot of things we build on when elections become transparent. When, look, look at the local government system. Can you talk about it? 99%, now 100%, those who state governors win the elections. There's no local government system in Nigeria. There's no local government election in Nigeria because, you know, there's even a mistake in the law, what you call in the local government and state joint, joint account, where the money is paid. The governors hold on to the money. <laughs> and the state local government can't see money. Before, local government used to do market, road, small amenities. They can't do anything right now. In Ogun State, a local government chairman complained that something was happening. As I'm talking to you, SSS and DSS, and everybody's breathing down his neck. is in this intention. Just because he made a statement in the democratic system. 
Even if it's accusation, the governors can take it in a civil way. Look, we can't walk Nigeria like this. If we keep on and everybody will speak one thing disappears, another one speaks disappears. No, the system can, we kill the process if the power that be is not removed for the appointing process. If look, look at the state. If the local government elections is conducted with the 100% win, look at Edo. The man who applied that the material for conduct of election be given to him, he was charged 94 million to be able to assess CTC of the document for the conduct of the local government election. The State Assembly and Co. will put up the, the judicial panel that will listen to that tribunal. So that instead of that, the person cannot go to court. So we can't, we must re-examine our electoral system. There's so much tight neck, there's so much hold on tight to power system that is, you know, going about those who are in power. Look, there's the issue of self, self, enlightened self-interest, there's issue of self-interest, but the fact is that there's a way the law will be so guided that you will find out that it will work for the interest of the masses. As far as the masses and the citizens start to see that there's a process that they can rely on, a process that is dependable, that will not manipulate the outcome, that will stand and it will be one man, one vote. As long as that starts to happen, you will find out that Nigerians will own the process. All right. So just a quick one before you go. Um, are you optimistic that at the end of the day, all these challenges notwithstanding, these elections, particularly that of Kogi and Imo, will be free and fair? I, 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 I wish Tainek, you know, you know, tried to redeem his reputation in the eyes of the public. It's not me. You can go to the street and ask. You can do a survey. It's, it's there. How people feel. I'm not the one who feel this way. I, I speak to people. I go out and I speak to a lot of people and I hear this. And you go to social media, you find out this is a perception. And most times, perception, if it's really rooted, is stronger than reality. So I, I, I think the honors beg is on INEC to do what is right and create an, conduct an election that Nigerians will start to depend on. And Nigerians and the voter party that we might express in the forthcoming election, you know, will be defeated in subsequent elections. All right, Peter Ahmed, former chairman, Inter-Party Advisory Council, thank you for coming on here today. Thank you very much. All right, well, back in a moment. Stay on with us. <laughs> 31 years ago, the then First Lady of Nigeria, Mariam Babangida, established the National Center for Women Development. Its purpose, to improve the lives of women, especially those in the rural areas, through skill acquisition and entrepreneurial training to help them become more productive and self-reliant. Tuesday, July the 18th, 2023, in the historic event, Senator Olure Mitunubu, wife of Nigeria's president, renamed this center after Mariam Babangida in recognition of the impact of her projects on women, particularly those in rural areas. The event was attended by the wives of governors, female legislators in the National Assembly, the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Women Affairs, and other dignitaries. Part of celebrations was also the induction of some Nigerian women who have distinguished themselves in different endeavors into the Nigeria Women Hall of Fame. Mrs. Tinubu praised the phenomenal contributions of late Mrs. Mariam Babangida to women development. She also commended the new inductees for their exceptional feats. This center being renamed today has reinforced my belief in the need for us as a people to celebrate the contributions of the matriarchs of our land, especially in nation building. As I believe that Miriam Babangida National Center for Women Development carries a profound message of inspiration and aspiration for Nigerian women. I Excellency Dr. Mrs. Babangida's legacy as a passionate advocate for women's rights serves as a constant reminder of what can be achieved when society invests in women's development. For these inductees, the recognition is an inspiration to all women in leadership positions to do more for Nigerian women that will be recorded by history. The legacy, the reflections of Miriam Babangida National Center for Women Development is the spirit of I can do, the spirit that every Nigerian woman has. And I think we should live on this spirit every day of our lives. If um, the achievements of um, late Dr. Miriam Babangida 
was not properly documented. For instance, if you go around, you see the list of all those who contributed money when this center was built. The list is still there. So it tells us that we need to start documenting ourselves, women. The Nigeria Women Hall of Fame specifically recognizes Nigerian women who have excelled in their chosen careers. It also provides role models for younger girls and the society at large on the ultimate potential of women in the Nigerian society. Victoria Longjohn, Channels Television News. All right, welcome back. Well, yes, as you've seen, uh, Uju Kennedy Hanaya joins us next. She is the Minister of Women Affairs. Good morning, and thank you for coming on today. Good morning. Thank you. So how are you settling into office? I'm so excited, really, because I have a lot to do. So many things are going on. So many things have been going on before the new president, Paula Ahmed Tinubu, came in. And I am willing and ready to address them. I'm willing to fight for the women. I'm willing to stand by them. I'm willing to defend the voiceless who are the children. I'm very eager to do my work. So what do you have on ground to work with? Did you get any handover notes from your predecessor? What did you find? Um, they gave me handover notes for the, my, the former minister and the, the um, yes, the Justice Permanent Secretary that just left. I looked into it, but I can assure you that I'm not dwelling on that yet. Because if I start looking back, to look forward will be a problem, and there's a lot to be done. All those other issues could be addressed later. Let me focus on how to get Nigerian women and children to live better and feel better and be protected so that they can breathe by the president so tell asked us, what, us to do. What can we... Is there any, I mean, tell us about your focus, your plan, your vision. What do we expect from you? I have a lot. I, I hope I have enough time to talk about it. Number one, let me start from the voiceless, who are the babies and children. So many things are going on. I'm sure Nigerians know. And I want to tell you, Chamberlain, I need the media to do this work. Media will solve almost 80 or 70 percent of Nigerian problems, especially on women and children, by looking into matters that concern them and addressing it without sentiment. So I am making sure now that the children that are voiceless that must be protected. Let me give you an example. There's an eight-year-old boy, a child, a girl, that was defiled by the stepfather. Eight-year-old girl. As we speak, the mother is not eager anymore to continue with the case. All they are planning around it through police, court, is how to get the man go free. Nobody is thinking about what that girl is feeling, the kind of depression that might be going in inside her, and no, no one will see that, except you understand what it means to defile by an elderly person, an 80-year-old child. So what am I doing now? I'm going to, I'm suing the woman or negligence. She has, she's doing that because nobody has actually followed her up on the negligence that brought about the defilement of that child. So I'm going to sue her for negligence, then I'm going to insist on the man going to court. I'm going to use my office to sue the man on behalf of the child, because the child it belongs to the state. That you are the mother doesn't mean you will relax and this child will go through all this and the man that did it will go free. So these are some of the issues that I know Nigeria has, that, that is going on in Nigeria today. So, well, isn't that going to compound the matter for the child? Because you, need, you still need the parents to ensure that they continue, or at least to make sure she gets a proper upbringing. You need some manner of cooperation from the parents. So if you sue her, how is that going to help anything? That will make her sit up and understand that she owes that girl some duties. If not, 
if she steps aside and allows the man to be prosecuted, I will not have issues with her. But if she doesn't do that, I will sue her and I'm going to involve the uh, welfare officers, I'm going to involve the uh, uh, mother of their state, who is the uh, governor's wife. I will involve them. We'll be checking on the girl and we'll be following up. I'm even looking at giving the girl scholarship to make sure she's okay. But for the man to go free, no way. Chamberlain. Now, do we, why, where do you think there's a gap? Why do these things keep happening? Are we focusing on the right things to address them? Do we have that structure? We have the structure, but it's not managed well. But fortunately, we have a president now, President Bola Metinubu, who is out for these voiceless people, the women, and the generally the poor masses of the country. So I have every opportunity to address it. Number one, if you take matters to court, it takes ages. If by the time they finish the case, that eight-year-old girl must have been probably 18 or 15. Why should she be going through that kind of thing and get matured, seeing these things happening in her life? So some of these things are the issue, which is, which is why I'm asking for a mobile court, so that we can facilitate these cases. Let it be, uh, be let, let us assume, nothing less than two months the case should be done with. If they are joined per day or every two days, why shouldn't it be done with? So these are some of the issues. I'm asking for a mobile court. I will probably ask for accelerated trials on cases like this, so that any time these cases go to a particular court, that court should know that you have this period of time to finish the case. So some of these are the problems. Then we probably have problems on the police side, generally on how things have been working in Nigeria. It's a problem. So we need to change the narratives. Which is part of why I was asking if, if you think that we have a structure to ensure that these things happen. But I imagine that you would have spoken with quite a number of uh, women, uh, young ladies as well. Have you been able to identify the challenge they face in terms of why many don't seem to come forward to bring up their matters and ensure they get closure and people who perhaps are guilty, as you are seeking now, face justice? Good. Some of the girls, some of the rape issues you're looking at, some come because of poverty. Some girls go to the wrong places they're not supposed to go to simply because somebody will ask them, come, I have something for you that could help you better your lives. So if we look into empowering these girls with skills when they are younger, it's going to help and cut down on issue of rape. Then issue of day reporting. If you see that Miss A reported and nothing has been done, why should you go ahead and report? So when we start addressing it, and making sure these people answer to their crimes. I believe a lot more people will come out and report. So we have to address that issue first. Let the rule of law work. Well, okay. I came across this data from UNICEF, and they say that over 60% of the 10 million children that are out of school are girls. How do you, how do you plan to address this? The same issue of what I'm talking about. Empower their mothers, which I'm already doing. We empower their mothers. We've t told them and advised them all the female meetings, women meetings they have in villages. Let them turn it to cooperatives. So that we empower them with machines. And equally, as we've gotten buyers for them on whatever they are producing, you produce according to what you could get, the, the raw materials in your state. So when we empower them, these mothers will have voice to take their children to school. But after empowering them and showing them how to fish and how to sell the fish, and they still end up leaving their children at home. The legal part will come in. The share should come in. Because we empower them and ex expect them to know that if your child does not go to school and the whistleblower reports, we will take you to court. And again, we are not using only radio and television anymore to sensitize people on any issue we are bringing up. We've equally introduced town criers. So you won't tell us you don't have radio or you Is, is that helping? Are you achieving results with that? It will achieve results. We just started. I need about three weeks. Call me back here and I'll give you the whole data of what is going on. And remember, even the reporting of these issues, we have data where they report, but how many villagers can get to those data to report? That is a problem. So with that town crier, this can equally help us a lot. All right, let me bring in my colleagues from Lagos.
Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chamberlain. Uh, Mrs. Ohane, um, you know, it's interesting to hear you talk about some of the programs that you have, particularly to tackle the issues of um, sexual and gender-based violence. And the one that you have mentioned, you know, about the eight-year-old that was abused, is just a one-off. There are several others, you know, that are being reported, particularly by non-governmental organizations who are handling such cases. But at the heart of such issues, you know, are gender desks in police stations across the country and family support unit desks in police stations across the country, which are not strengthened to tackle these issues. There is that gnawing concern of lack of funds to investigate, and then they put the burden on the um, survivor you know, to bring funds for investigations. And mo most of the time, some of these survivors, you know, before the case even starts, get frustrated and they drop the case. What are you doing? Do you have any program to strengthen gender desks and family support unit desks in Nigerian police stations before they even get to that uh, mobile court that you're advocating for? Okay. I didn't hear the last part of the question. Okay, I, I, I'll try and make it as okay, brief as possible this okay. time. Okay, I, I invited the, all the desk officers I have across the, all the ministries. I, I invited them over last week. We had a meeting because as I'm changing the style, I have to carry them along. So I explained to them the lapses we have, which you know what the lapses are. And I want to assure you that most times you see these people collecting money from the survivors. It's out of that same corruption we are talking about. Because they, you wouldn't need to collect that money from them. What are the donors doing? We have donors. But instead of the money from the donors to be used to do the right things that we favor this, um, the, the masses, especially the poor masses, they rather use it than do advocacies. They do meetings, summits, travel around, 140 million goes into all those things, while the major job that, to, that is to be done, there will be no money to do that. So some of these things have been addressed. I've called the donors, I've had meetings with them. I've told them that the narratives must have to be changed. Instead of us to continue with the advocacy, let's first implement what we have advocated before now. So these are some of the steps I am taking to cop out some of these issues you mentioned to me right now. And then you come to the mobile court you're talking about. When I spoke about mobile court, before I went to have a meeting, I first had a meeting with the president. He gave me a nod. Then I had a meeting with the attorney general of Nigeria. I didn't go there alone. I went there with the inspector general of police. I went there with some of the donors. I went with uh, some of the NGOs and that are part of this uh, issue, this, uh, part of the issue. So when we got there, we all addressed the, the case. And we said, number one, before we start the mobile court, let them approve it. When they approve it, we first empower these women. We first sensitize them to the town criers, radios, televisions, so that nobody will tell us, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Then by the time we do that, then we already know that there is a mobile court. If you commit this crime, this is what is going to happen to you. And police is part of this discussion. And when the crime is committed, we have our whistleblowers who will first alert the police and us. We make sure the police picks the people up, we check if it is freshly done, and then we take them to court. So police was part of this plan. The gender offices will be a part of this plan. They're part of this uh, change of narratives. So in a short while, you're going to see a different thing and a different ways of handling the, these matters, I'm sure. Very soon, the women and the children will smile. But, but besides the donors making funds available and the embezzlement, uh, wouldn't, shouldn't you rather be advocating for an increase in uh, funding for investigation for these gender deaths across the country in line with what should really be the responsibility of the federal government, such that uh, whether or not donors are making funds available, uh, the police is empowered to uh, tackle these cases? Yes, it's already on the pipeline. Uh, the renewed hope of President Bola Tinubu is one of the eight agendas there to look into these issues, especially on women and children. So he has already, they have already come from the presidency to ask us to increase our budget, of which we have done. 
and it's just for the time, when it is time, we will submit it and these things will be taken care of. But the issue of police is the Attorney General that will ask for that, for the extra funds. And because we are in this together, all hands are on deck to make sure these sufferings will come to an end. Then you come to the hospital, <coughs> you heard about the hospital <coughs> too. We are equally going to look into it. In a short while, I will be asking Chamberlain to invite the CMDs and myself to channels so that they will address on the issue of how to, how to tackle abandoning patients when they're taken there on emergency. And I know, even as we speak from here, I'm heading to my Tema Hospital. I'm going to there to fight on behalf of the late girl that they abandoned so that we make sure it never happens again. So we are going to get more than enough funds to do this work. As we speak, I'm already using the little funds I have to empower the women. I'm bringing in, I'm, I'm arranging for roasting uh, machine for roasting 500 fish a day. I'm going to give it to some people in Lagos where they, they have fish available. And some other states, they have fish available. I'm getting in rice milling machines, four steps of rice milling machines. I'm going to increase the number of bags of rice the women could produce. That will give them more money and that could equally bring down the price of rice. I don't really need so much to achieve some of these things. All it needs is a better organization. And when you organize yourself better, these things are gotten so cheaply here in Nigeria because the, the fish machine is produced here in Nigeria and there's some of these things I'm going to get are here, except very few that we still have to bring in from China due to lack of time. And we don't have... We want to deliver these things and deliver a lot of bags of rice within the 100 days of my stay here. Uh, just before I yield the floor to my colleague, you were quoted as advocating uh, the use of children for the production of toothpick uh, recently, as it is done in China uh, to reduce uh, uh, unemployment. Uh, I, I'd like you to articulate that, because some would see that as child labor, and how you know, proper that would be within the context of the high number of out-of-school children that uh, you know, Nigeria is currently bedeviled with. My dear girl, I've, or girl or woman, I don't know. I, I, I have addressed this issue severally. I was on a rice TV, I addressed it. I never said the children will be used for production of toothpicks. I don't know why you people keep mentioning toothpick. I want you to realize that toothpick is one of the best businesses anybody can do. Because we are still importing it. Shamelessly. We are still importing toothpick. And if we start producing it here, when we have all the machineries we need, all the raw materials are here, and we start producing it, that will bring in a lot of, it will help to build the nation. So when you mention toothpick, I mention it as if it is nothing. And moreover, I never said the, the children should produce toothpick. I said, I want to put on vocational machines in schools where these children will learn skills. If they learn skills, it will help them to have a voice. To so say, no, I don't want to marry now. Because she has something to help herself with when she gets to 18 years. I never said, well, they're in school, they should produce in it. And I probably said, I will not bring just ordinary people to teach them. I will have it as a factory there. So that while they're being taught, the factory can equally be producing that same thing and be making small money to empower those girls when they leave school and turn 18. That was exactly what I said. Not that we are going to use our children to produce toothpick, but they will be in classes. I will tell you there's a school in Gariki. I've said it before, and I'm saying it again. I hope Nigerians will get bored with my repetition of these things. I, I, uh, in this school, I went there personally to visit them. They have a lot, lot of acquisition centers. They have for plumbers. They have people that produce chairs. These children go there, the ones that are plumbers. A lot of girls are, are learning to be a plumber in future in this place. And they're producing things while they're teaching them. The, the tables they're using in their schools are produced from those factories mm. that they're teaching them those acquisitions. In, from. Yeah. So what are we talking about? Mm. Why well, should it be misunderstood? That's why I keep telling you, I need media to push this thing forward. Mm. If you okay. continue discouraging... Uh, uh, ministers that want to work according to the agendas of this uh, president. 
in normal circumstances, I would have been hiding under the table by now mm. with the kind of uh, scandal that was bringing up on, uh, about my work. Well, what's I'm interesting, madam... People, uh, we need you to do this work. Yeah. What's interesting is that as far back as the Ad Obasanjo administration in this fourth republic, he banned um, toothpick importation, among many other things, and one wonders why that is still an issue. But, you know, let me focus on collaborations, madam. First, with other ministries, departments, and agencies that you need to work with. I hear you saying you want to empower some women, you know, and all. But we also know that there is a ministry in charge of social welfare and all of that, and they are doing a number of things in that regard. Uh, ensuring that the women on the National Social Register, uh, especially those who are, uh, you know, the breadwinners in their homes, the leaders of their homes, they also get good enough representation. So let's speak about collaboration. How difficult or not is it for ministries such as yours and that of the social welfare development, humanitarian affairs and all in particular, I mean, just starting with those ones, to collaborate so that your job is easier and uh, you, you, you are able to work together to help Nigerians get the, the needed interventions to make li their lives better. Okay. It's Ministry of Health that is in charge of social welfare. Ministry of Health. And we're collaborating. Uh. We're even going to have a meeting with the First Lady today. And I'm assuring you we're doing things together. But the particular <laughs> issue of empowerment I'm talking about, I want to introduce it the way I, I feel it's going to help these women. And then others will join. I'm doing partly with education, partly with Minister of Health, humanitarian. Humanitarian is equally doing her bit. All of us under the administration of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, we really, really want to make sure that the poor break and that nobody suffocates them. So we're mm -hmm. collaborating seriously. It will be and interesting. All hands are on deck. Yes, it will be interesting, madam, to, to, to determine, to be able to identify the areas of collaboration so that there are no clashes and there is no unnecessary grandstanding because you know that we've seen that, <coughs> excuse me, previously in the country where some ministries, uh, ministers are trying to grandstand you know, against each, each other. The Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, you know, are in charge of the social register and all. So, uh, what kind of collaboration is really happening? with that ministry and Ministry of Health as well, primary health care and all those, all those things also take place. If you can give us an idea of what kinds of collaborations are happening with other ministries uh, and ministers who are your colleagues. Okay, it's the Ministry of Health that is in charge of social welfare. It has been moved to Ministry of Health. And we had a meeting shortly before I traveled home for my mom's burial. That was a day before I traveled home for my mom's burial, which was on Thursday, um, Tuesday last week. And we agreed on both uh, breast cancer on women and other cancers that concerns women. And there will be vaccination free for these women. The jingles will come on air very soon, and the town criers will only move ahead to do what they need to do to sensitize the women about it. And when we're doing that, we only use a woman that they will trust enough especially in the north, to explain to them what's going on. Then humanitarian affairs, she has her duties. My duties and hers are not generally the same. She could go there and empower women in a way to solve their uh, humanitarian crisis. In my own case, I'm empowering them with machineries to make them start producing things and make it more sustainable. So if I do that and humanitarian gives them money and all that things they will use to settle in, it still works together. It's a win-win. Okay. So for now, we should all focus on our own, be on our tracks for now and get it done. And we are going to complement each other with what we are doing from different angles to arrive to the center where we achieve the uh, agenda of the, of the president. All right. So that's how... how we are actually collaborating. I even went to the education on the issue of uh, um, adolescent girls. Good. And I insisted that if these girls will be brought, I would like to see the list. Because I remember before my president came in, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, there was money meant for farmers, for we, uh, uh, female farmers, that was in a um, central bank. At the end of the day, a lot of rich people went and assessed those monies. Huh. 
So now I want to be sure the list of people they are giving out so that we'll, we'll be 100% sure that these are people that really need our help, the vulnerables. And I discussed with the, with the Minister for Education. He gave me his word. I've written letters to all the people I'm supposed to collaborate with. Okay. I can, I can send these letters to you with the date it was received. Well, and told that, them that's, that. that's cheering news, Things have madam. changed. Yeah. Now, and anything concerning women, I have to be involved. Now, since you want to be involved in everything that concerns women, how about your collaboration with state governments? Because you know, of course, that they are closer to the people in their different states, and those are the people you also want to intervene in their lives. So how easy is collaboration with the state governments, uh, you know, with their own ministries uh, in charge of women affairs? We, we have women affairs commissioners across the nation. As we speak, they are working with me. They are amazing. The governors are cooperating. It, it's as if this is the time for women and children. This is the time for Nigeria Massey. It is, that is, I, I can't even explain the kind of understanding and col uh, collaboration I'm getting from these angles. And we are having a meeting in two weeks' time with all the commissioners. This is the second time I'm having these meetings with them. We had one at Calabar, but this new one is to get them more involved in the new narration we have brought in. So that is the point. All right, we'll have to thank you for coming on here today, and uh, definitely we'll be back and uh, get some updates in terms of your plans, your focus, what you've achieved, and how to move forward. So for now, we thank you for coming on. Uh, Uju Kennedy Ohane, Minister thank of you. Women Affairs, who is also a lawyer. Thank you, and all the best. Thank you. God bless you. All right, we're back in a moment. Stay on with us. Welcome back. Yes, indeed. Uh, focusing our attention now on the Middle East. And as you've seen there, we're joined by His Excellency Michael Freeman, Ambassador of Israel to Nigeria. Good morning and thank you for joining us on the program here today. Well, it was a shock. I mean, the world woke up shocking to see what was going on in, on Saturday morning. But uh, yes, indeed, we all want peace in the Middle East. But can you go ahead and tell us, what is the current situation now? Good morning. Yeah, we, we all woke up on Saturday morning, which was the Holy Sabbath, a Jewish festival as well, to the, the shocking news that uh, hundreds of Hamas terrorists had entered, had infiltrated Israel, and had gone on a murderous death rampage throughout, uh, the, throughout uh, Israel, the south of Israel, murdering men, women, and children, uh, defiling their bodies, do, uh, raping pillaging, doing all sorts of uh, evil things. And we now know that over 700 Israeli civilians were murdered, uh, including 260 young people who were at a music festival. They were out partying at a music festival uh, when these Hamas terrorists came in and massacred them in cold blood, shooting in any way. Um, we have reports of them raping the, the, those people there and then killing them, entire families being wiped out. Um, and also, we've seen over 3,000 rockets fired. And at this moment, this morning, we are still fighting Hamas terrorists inside Israeli territory, inside seven different towns and villages in Israel. And we will uh, do what we need to do to take control of these areas, to liquidate the terrorists. And then we will respond in this war, this war that has been declared by Hamas, and we will do everything we need to protect our population and to protect our people. Well, it's uh, shocking. I mean, some of the revelations now that you just highlighted. But there are equally several concerns. I mean, I know that uh, uh, Israel will also be reviewing the situation and asking questions and how some of these things happen. But if I could just ask this before I move on. I mean, many were also wondering how those rockets were able to defy the Iron Dome and get into those cities and the areas where it landed. I'm sure that those are part of the considerations that uh, Israel will also be considering in the long term. 
Well, um, first thing, we will be asking some of the questions and how this happened, how uh, these, these death squads managed to come into Israel and massacre our, our women and children. With regard to the Iron Dome, the Iron Dome is not perfect. The Iron Dome still shoots down 90, over 90% of all of the rockets that are heading for civilian populations. And I dread to think what would have happened if we wouldn't have had the Iron Dome. Um, you know, 3,000 rockets, the vast, vast majority of them have been shot down. But still, some of them get through and some of them land on buildings and some of them land in the towns and villages where they're aimed. Um, but fortunately, the level of, uh, the level of uh, death from those rockets has been limited. The vast majority of those deaths, in fact, 99% of those deaths uh, so far have been from these death squads from people who came in and deliberately targeted men, women, and children. We have stories of them going door to door, dragging children out by their hair, dragging women out by their hair, and shooting them dead in cold blood. Well, in terms of the response by Israel, I mean, you also want to ensure that um, you don't have a lot more casualties in your response to this. But part of the concern, too, is how is Israel going to proceed further without getting into mm. a street fight with IDF in Gaza, for instance? OK, it may be that's what we have to do. Uh, we will do everything we can to avoid civilian casualties on the uh, Palestinian side. This is not a fight between Israel and Palestinians. This is not a fight between Israelis and Palestinians. This is a war between Israel and Hamas, a radical terror organization that has massacred Israelis and kidnapped. You shouldn't forget, they've also kidnapped over 100 Israelis, young girls, young babies, old women, 84-year-old women, 85-year-old women, two-year-old, six-month-old babies have been kidnapped. Um, so we, we, we recognize the difficulty. We will do everything we can to avoid civilian casualties on the Palestinian side, but we will do everything we need to do in order to secure our population. You know, what would any country in the world do? What would Nigeria do? What would any country do faced with this invasion? You have a responsibility to keep your people safe. You have a responsibility to keep your country safe. And that's what we will do. We will now keep our people and our country safe. And we will do whatever we need to do in order to achieve that. So how, uh, because, I mean, if that were to be the case, I mean, any country will, will respond and handle and ensure that their citizens are safe. But in terms of the difficulties that uh, Israel will face moving forward on this one, I mean, I... I so several possibilities and narratives and things that you may also face moving forward. For instance, it said that, look, if in the end, in the event that uh, IDF engages in this street fight, you may have to challenge battle with Hezbollah in the north. You could also see Palestinian militant groups in West Bank, meaning Israel may end up with this three-pronged war, and ultimately you may face, it, face a threat from Iran. Are those part of the considerations here? Yeah, you're, you're quite right. Uh, that is a, a major concern for us. We know that Iran is behind this attack by Hamas. Iran are the ones uh, who gave permission. Iran are the ones who fund Hamas. They are doing everything they can to destabilize the region. As you say, they are also backing Hezbollah in Lebanon. They're backing other terror groups in the West Bank. They're backing terror groups in Syria. Uh, and Iran is doing everything because they don't want to see progress. They don't want to see peace. They want to see death and destruction. Um, and we will do what we need. We hope that Hezbollah and we hope that other groups understand that we do not want any engagement. We do not want any war in any other areas. But if people, if, uh, these, if Iran gives the instruction, Hezbollah join, then we will fight on that front as well. We are prepared. We will defend our population, we will defend our citizens, and we will make sure that, uh, that uh, these, these terrible scenes, and you know, I, I, I've chosen not to share the photos, but I'm sure some of your viewers would have seen on social media some of the horrific photos of old women gunned down at bus stops, grandmas gunned down in the streets, young babies shot, children murdered in front of their parents. All of these are, are, are going around, women and children and young people at a, at a music festival, gunned down and blown up. Um, this, is, this is what we've dealt with, and we will do what we need to do now to protect our population. And this war was started by Hamas. 
and we will end this war. Well, Your Excellency, you know, a good number of people would wonder, I mean, just as uh, my colleague asked you, it's uh, rather shocking that it even happened because there was no no hush-hush anywhere about it. So uh, one of the questions that some people might be asking is, what is the root of this whole conflict in the first place? Because unless there was some kind of background to it, a good number of people will be wondering, why would Hamas or whoever just get up and attack another nation without cause? What, in your opinion, uh, brought this whole conversation up in the first place? Uh, look, it's a great question, and, and for many people, it's difficult to understand. Uh, but Hamas's ideology and their, their raison d'etre, the reason they exist, is to kill Israelis. They state that. They said that their aim, their life, their, 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 their motivation is to kill Israelis and to destroy Israel. So they saw an opportunity that they felt they could take in order to come across the border and slaughter and murder women and children, because that's what they believe. That's what they do. That's who they are. Um, and therefore, they don't need an excuse. They'll make an excuse up. They'll lie. They'll tell whatever they want to do to make up some story. But the reality is their ideology and their reason they were formed is to wipe Israel out and to destroy Israel and to kill Israelis. Well, issues around the Gaza Strip, uh, the West Bank and the rest of them have been on for many, many decades. So there are a good number of people who wonder whether or not this has one thing or the other to do with um, occupation, you know, you know, of a particular territory that some people feel shouldn't be, you know, a place where Israel should be and that Israel is. Uh, can you give us a background to that? Absolutely. Um, I think there are two key things to say here. Number one is that in 2005, Israel left Gaza. Um, everybody said to us, you need to leave. We took the decision to leave. We took out every single soldier, every single troop, every single Israeli citizen, as they're referred to often as settlers. We took every single one of them out of uh, Gaza. From 2005, there has not been any occupation in Gaza. There's not been a single soldier, single settler, single anybody living in, in Gaza. Um, so, you know, to talk about occupation is a myth. To talk about that is just not true. That's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that on this issue, this is not about Israel or Palestine. You know, we can, you and I can disagree, you and I can agree, many people can talk and disagree or agree about the issue of Israel and Palestine. But what we saw over the last 40 hours, 48 hours, is not about that. It's about humanity and evil. It is about people who have deliberately targeted women and children. Let's make no mistake. Let's be very, very clear. These death squads came in and shot people at bus stops. They went into houses. They went door to door, murdering and massacring women and children. They went door to door, raping and pillaging and defiling bodies. They took people back into Gaza. We know that they have beheaded people. This is, this is base evil. This is not about Israel and Palestine. This is about humanity versus evil. We haven't seen this except in places like ISIS and Daesh. This is, this is, this is the type of level we're talking about. Mm. And the whole world condemns that. And, and the whole world is condemning Hamas for, for what we've seen. Well, most certainly condemnable activity from, from world leaders all over the world. You know, but one other very concerning thing, which you are, of course, also aware of, you may want to give us figures to it. We understand that there have been kidnappings also um, on the other side uh, from Israel. How many Israelis would you, are you aware of have been kidnapped or been held as prisoners of war on the other side? And what's the plan to bring them first, back home? Firstly, uh, these are kidnaps. These are, these are not prisoners of war. A, a, a six-month-old baby is not a prisoner of war. A four-year-old girl is not a prisoner of war. An 85-year-old grandma is not a prisoner of war. These are kidnapping. These have been kidnapped. They are kidnapped victims. We do not yet know the exact number. We know it's over 100. Um, what, over 100 Israelis have been kidnapped, have been uh, taken into, into Gaza uh, against international law, against humanitarian law, against Islamic law. We should also, uh, we should also put that out there. What we've seen over the last 48 hours, uh, with no questions, have been... Uh, 
uh, crimes, uh, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity. Uh, these are crimes against all the major religions, against Christianity, against Judaism, against Islam. Uh, these, are, these are terrible things that we have seen. Um, and, and obviously, the, uh, our priority is to bring, to bring our citizens back, to bring back those people uh, back from within Gaza, where they're being held, where we don't know what's happening to them, but certainly the Hamas's history would imply that they, uh, that they are not going to be held in good conditions. They will not have any access to medical or any other, uh, or any international Red Cross. These people have been kidnapped. They are being held. And uh, we will do everything to bring them back. It's a terrible tragedy. Indeed, and very condemnable. Your Excellency, part of the report suggests that the reason for this attack by Hamas is to derail the Middle East policy uh, of President Joe Biden, uh, diplomatic policy to be precise, uh, uh, with Saudi Arabia. What's contained in this Middle East policy that has left out Palestinian and is unsettling Hamas leaders? Uh, look, this is uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, we, we, we've seen that Israel over the last three, in the last three to four years, has made significant progress. We've developed relations with the United Arab Emirates, with Bahrain, with Morocco, with Sudan. There are certainly conversations with Saudi Arabia, um, and this uh, this this scares people who hate. And Iran hates, and Iran wants to destabilize the entire region. Hamas, who uh, wants uh, us all dead who want me dead, who want my children dead, my wife dead, my, my, my parents, my, my friends, my relatives, they want every Israeli dead. Uh, for them, progress is a bad thing, and therefore they will do anything to try and derail the peace process and to derail normalizations between Israel and, and, and our neighbors. We won't let that happen. We will continue to move forward. We will continue to reach out our hand in peace, um, and we won't let this Iranian-backed terror organization stop having a better future for me and for my children and for my grandchildren. Mm. Uh, if um, uh, the Gaza or the uh, um, exit of Israel, so to speak, from Gaza since 2005 has not resolved this and the peace process by President Joe Biden is not satisfactory, uh, what do you think will be the enduring solution that will stop this, you know, continuing tension between um, Gaza, Palestinians, and Israel? Well, we need to destroy Hamas. Hamas, as a terror organization that is committed to making sure that Israel is destroyed, to making sure there is no peace process. Hamas doesn't want a peace process. Hamas wants no accommodation with Israel. Hamas wants no end. And, and, and if we all want a better future, and all of us want peace, and all of us want an accommodation for them between the Palestinians, we need to make sure Hamas don't exist to be part of that. Hamas will do everything to destroy it. We've seen throughout the years their bus bombings. We've seen throughout the years their terrorism and their terrorism throughout Israel. Um, and this is the, their, their worst ever uh, attempt at doing that. And um, and therefore, we need to make sure that they aren't part of uh, this conversation anymore. We can't talk about peace and we can't talk about moving forward with an organization, a terror organization, that is, that is raping, that is killing, that is slaughtering children and slaughtering women. There's no compromise there. These people have no part in any dialogue. They have no part in any decent human society. And we need to make sure that Hamas and we're being very specific here about Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, need to be destroyed, and they need to be destroyed in a way that they can never do this again. I know that uh, Israel did ask that the UN Security Council condemn the scenario that played out and uh, labeled as war crimes. So do you have any updates on that, and how significant will that be for Israel? We, 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 we hope that any decent and every decent country in the world will, will condemn this. This is such a clear war crime, probably a crime against humanity that we have seen. I, I um, unfortunately have, been, have seen uh, horrific pictures, pictures that I would not want to show on TV and to show your viewers of things that were done. Uh, ironically, these were recorded by Hamas. Hamas are the ones who've recorded them doing these things. They've posted them up onto social media. And, uh, 
you know, they're, they're proud of uh, when they go around and they are and they are doing these terrible things uh, where they are proud of the fact that they are defiling human bodies. They are proud of the fact that they are shooting children in front of their parents. There's a horrific scene of, uh, of a family with uh, three children, the first child being shot in front of the parents, and the young children and the parents forced to watch this, of, uh, of um, Israelis being beheaded. Um, and we're, we're, we're seeing this being posted by Hamas. So we, we expect everybody to condemn this in a loud and clear voice because, you know, when we see radical terrorism inside Israel, it never stays there. We've seen it with ISIS. We've seen it with Boko Haram. We see it with ISWAP. We see it with, with all of those terror organizations. And therefore, anybody who wants to fight against this terror needs to condemn it in a clear voice. Uh, because if not, it will come to their countries as well. We've seen how that works. All right, so we have to thank you for coming on. Uh, Your Excellency Michael Freeman, Ambassador of Israel to Nigeria, thank you for your time and all the best to you. Thank you very much. All right, but uh, we also did have a statement from Nigeria's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the press statement was titled, The Federal Government of Nigeria Calls for the Escalation of Hostilities Between Israel and Hamas. The federal government of Nigeria is deeply concerned about the outbreak of hostilities between Israel and Hamas in the early hours of Saturday, 7th October 2023, and calls for de-escalation and ceasefire. The cycle of violence and retaliation that the current escalation has assumed only serves to perpetuate an unending cycle of pain and suffering for the civilian population that bear the brunt of every conflict. The federal government of Nigeria therefore calls on both sides to exercise restraint, prioritize the safety of civilians, and give room for humanitarian considerations. We are therefore calling for a peaceful resolution of the conflict through dialogue. That is signed by Ambassador Yusuf Tuga O and Minister of Foreign Affairs. Well, let's go on now and take a look at uh, some comments uh, coming from you. This email about the off-cycle election, the governorship elections, comes from Joseph Oludari. He says, to start with, Nigerians are the subnational units going for off-cycle elections must step up to be informed about how their states are governed. How many of these governors standing election have signed into law an unrealistic retirement package, or have accepted such bad laws without amending them? How many of them governors have published the revenue and the expenditure of their states for the time spent in office? It's not just about re-election, but accountability for what has been entrusted to them in the last four years. Moreover, INEC cannot be accused of poor election management without political parties putting forward adequate agents that will monitor and report irregularities. Achieving credible polls is beyond counting and registering ballots. It requires stakeholders, the INEC, political parties, security agencies, citizens and CEOs doing the right thing at the right time. Well, this one is from Taiwo Olokpade. He says, I agree with your guest that INEC chairman should not be appointed by Mr. President. There is high possibility that he or she may want to be sympathetic to the government in power. The Minister for Women Affairs, Uju Kennedy, sounds like she's on top of her job. She needs to move with the speed of light to assist women across the country who suffer more from every adversity. God bless Nigeria. Professor Enakena in a tweet says... We must vote leaders who must realize that we live in very hard times and Nigerians have become more vulnerable and objectively more diversified and vigilant than they've always been. So our governors must respond to the demands of building a new Nigeria that will presumably curtail a probable decadent society where her leaders are visionless. Another tweet from T.T. Tor says it will take a strong leader it will take a strong-headed leader with very little interest in power retention to implement the needed policies that will return power to the Nigerian people. Unfortunately, we don't have that yet. The corrupt system in place is scientific. <laughs> it needs to, to be studied. Unfortunately. That is uh, 
<laughs> well, that's going to be an interesting one because, I mean, you know what they say about uh, eternal vigilance. So we all cannot afford to drop the ball at any point in time. Well, that is the show today. We thank you all for watching. We'll see you again here bright and early on Sunrise Diddy. I am Train Balloon, so goodbye. Well, thank you for watching. We'll be back again soon. I am Bukola Koka. Bye for now. The key word today is vigilance, okay? Don't forget that. Amaya Makinde, have a wonderful day.